So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's webinar. To, this week, we're talking to um, Lauren Shalou, Katie Starsmore, and Ben Lehart, uh, who are working on greenhouse gas emissions. So Lawrence is going to give us a presentation in relation to the background of GHGs and so forth and how we can mitigate against them in uh, dairy systems. And Ben and Katie are going to show you then the machines that we're using in Moore Park at the moment in order to try and uh, estimate greenhouse gas emissions from cows and examine ways of reducing those. So we'll hand over to you there. So Lawrence, your presentation is sharing already. So you can start away. So Lawrence is only going to be with us for 20 minutes. He has another engagement that he has to go to. So if you have questions, please put them in as we go along so that I can ask them before he, he leaves, okay? Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so I suppose my, my main job here is just to give you a background to, um, you know, and, and some of you probably know the whole story with the emissions, to give a little bit of a background to it, uh, talk about some of the strategies that we have, and then I suppose uh, the most of, of today, in particular with Ben and Katie, will be around the research that we are doing uh, I suppose to look at further reduction of emissions. So a little bit on background, a little bit on emissions, and then I'll hand it over to Katie and Ben, who will deal with the, um, the real work that's happening here. So I, I, I like to put up this slide just to kind of contextualize what we do in terms of uh, dairy production, and particularly in grass-based dairy production. So, uh, you know, I suppose what we're trying to do is uh, produce protein that humans can, can, can eat. So sometimes when we look at protein efficiency, we look at total efficiency. So when we look at the animal, we look at what the animal is producing from a milk point of view, from a carcass point of view and so on, versus what um, is being consumed by livestock in terms of feed, whether that's grass silage, concentrate or whatever. Um, and that's total efficiency. I suppose what's much more useful is to look at net efficiency, which is human edible in versus human edible out. Obviously, as humans, we can't eat grass or a lot of the products that animals eat. So when we look at the efficiency of our system, we need to be looking at it from what human edible is being produced versus what human edible is, uh, is going into the system. And that really tells us how, how um, efficient or how useful our systems are. Um, and, and when we look at grass-based systems, I think we have a narrative here that we need to, um, you know, I suppose, look at more. So a TMR is a total mixed ration where animals are housed uh, indoors. That's virtually, you know, the vast majority of milk globally is produced that way. Animals are housed, they're fed uh, a mixed ration, they're not let out to, to pasture. Um, versus grass-based system. So I suppose the first thing to say, when we look at a total mixed ration versus grass-based system, from a total efficiency point of view, neither are great. Um, protein in versus protein out is somewhere around 30, 30%, uh, 35%. When we look at net protein efficiency, and again, this is based on this French work by Lies, um, a TMR system is just about producing uh, the same amount of uh, human edible protein out as it's it's consuming. And I suppose when we look at it from uh, some of the negative externalities associated with animal production, um, you know, I suppose that's not a very good ratio. However, when we look at grass-based systems, um, and this again is from that French paper, but when we look at grass-based systems, those ratios were somewhere around uh, 2.6, 2.7 to 1. When we look at it, and a PhD student, student here working with us, Donna Hennessy, is, is looking at this, but when we look at Irish grass-based systems, um, they're closer to four to one. So for every one kilo of human edible protein going into the Irish cow's diet, we're getting out four. And I suppose if we look at, um, you know, looking at our system going forward, looking at justifying our system going forward, uh, this is an extremely important metric, uh, especially as pressure comes on uh, to, in particular, around greenhouse gases. I also just put in this slide to talk, you know, just to look at how does um, milk compare? And you know, there's you know a strong narrative out there around uh, the comparison of, of milk relative to some other products. And what this study done, it's a Norwegian study, what it does is it looks at uh, a range of products relative to the nutrients you get from the products. So it looks at their emissions and it looks at the nutrients you get relative to your requirement by the human body. So first thing to, to note here is that if we look at the emissions for a uh, hundred grams or a liter, you know, this one's for hundred grams, uh, milk, dairy milk, 99, versus soy milk and oat milk are 13, 21. So they are a lot lower. So that's an important point to make. So for the same hundred grams of product, the emissions are lower. But when we look at that analysis and look at it 
relative to the nutrients that you're getting, relative to the nutrients you require, you get a completely different story. And you know, you look at the uh, nutrients relative to the emissions. So for that same 100 grams of, of, of milk, uh, the nutrient density requirement um, that you're getting is 0.54 for, for milk, whereas for some of the other products, it's a lot lower, in particular looking at soya and, and oat milk. So I suppose what, the, what we're trying to say here is relative to our requirements, uh, it's important that we reflect the, um, you know, what the, the emissions relative to the product. So it's not a like for like when we do those comparisons. Sometimes when these comparisons are done, they're done in a very simple way uh, where there is no um, cognizance taken of what you get from the product. I suppose if we just look and this is the Irish emissions uh, from, from overall Irish emissions over the last, between 1990 and 2017. And basically what it shows here is that the emissions peaked in uh, 2001 2 at about 70 million tons of ZPA data, around 70 million tons, and they have been declining. They declined, um, you know, following our severe re recession, 2010-11. And I suppose they have been starting to, to creep up again since, since 2011-12, uh, and just heading over the 60 million tons um, again since then. If we look at agriculture, um, and it follows the national trend quite closely, our peak emissions occurred in 97, 98 at about 22 million tons from agriculture. They dropped to about 18 million tons in 2011, 12. Again, this was, um, I suppose, suckler cow numbers uh, had been, I, I suppose dairy cow numbers had been declining uh, until milk quotas uh, were going to be removed and then numbers started to increase again. So our, our, you know, at 18 million tons is where we were at minimum and uh, we're just heading back over that 20 million tons again. So an important point to note is from an agricultural perspective, emissions are rising, but emissions are still 10% lower than they were at peak from agriculture. And output from agriculture has increased over that period, you know, dairy 61%, beef 13%, uh, and pig production has also increased. So the output has increased um, um, and our emissions are still lower than they were at peak. Now that doesn't mean that we, 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 we obviously sit back and rest in our laurels. There is a requirement to, to reduce emissions. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So just in terms of then how do we compare? When we look at our systems relative to, again, back to that TMR indoor system, how do our grass-based systems compare? And what we have here is a number of um, studies that I'm just gonna flick through here that uh, do those comparisons um, and they're based on work that we did over the last uh, seven or eight years here. First thing to say is when we look at an LCA, an LCA is a life cycle assessment and essentially what a life cycle assessment does is it takes all emissions into account when we're comparing different products. So a grass-based system and a confinement system with all emissions taken into account, for example, enteric fermentation, the biggest one, manure management, grazing, indirect in loss, concentrate and so on. So we can see here that you know grass-based systems based on the life cycle assessment uh, have the lowest emissions per unit of product um, and confinement systems had about 15% more emissions per unit of product. Just an interesting point to note is that the profile of what's causing these emissions is different as well. Methane is a bigger proportion of the grass-based uh, and the indirect you know, concentrate and so on are a lot less of a component. Whereas if we look at our TMR system or uh, our confinement system, uh, methane is a lower component and then the indirect uh, products that are brought in are a much higher component to those systems. And this is based on published work we did over the last number of years. Again, based on work we've done nationally looking at our individual farms, what we can see here is that there's huge range in terms of the emissions per unit of product across a group of farms. Uh, and again, what it shows here is, you know, that that range ranged down from, you know, 0.7 up to roughly 1.8. So massive range. You could look at that very negatively and say, right, there's a lot of um, inefficiency here, or you could look at it positively and say that there's a lot of scope to reduce emissions um, nationally, which is something I suppose is the way we like to, to look at it. And I suppose this helps as well in terms of when we look at the relationship between emissions and profitability. And basically what we're showing here is from the National Farm Survey. What we're showing here is that uh, the most profitable farms on a net margin per hectare also had the least emissions. So the bottom third in net margin per, per, per hectare had the, had the uh, highest emissions. The, the mean group were 9% lower per unit of product and the top group were 15% lower. So what that reassures us is that the focus on technologies to increase efficiency 
uh, and profitability are at the same time helping to reduce emissions uh, from, from the product, which is, is positive uh, in terms of, of the work that um, we encourage our farmers to do. How do we compare internationally? Again, this is the you know, last paper I'm gonna put up. It's just a piece of work we did um, about four years ago, five years ago, where we compared a really high performing research farm in Ireland versus the same in the UK and the US. And we had collaborators from the UK and the US uh, in these studies. And we did a comparison using the same model and the same methodology, which is really important because you know, there can be substantial differences between methods and, and, and models. And essentially what it showed was that our Irish farmers had emissions that were uh, approximately 9% lower in the UK and about 16% lower in the US for their top performing farms. And that's using the same model and the same methodology. Other studies show different results, but they tend to use different, uh, you know, they just use individual country specific numbers, not using the same methods or methodology. And finally, just in the comparison zone, um, this is the, um, I suppose, the um, most recent, which is still a bit dated, is 2010, um, EU study looking at a whole range of countries. And this was done um, by the JRC. And it basically what it shows in, based on that 2010 study was that Ireland had the lowest emissions or one, one of the lowest, it was, it was that and um, uh, I think it was Austria had the lowest emissions. So, you know, Ireland, very, very good performer from that point of view. Obviously, this study is dated and needs to be updated uh, now, uh, but we would not expect that the results to change very dramatically from, from this. So having said all that positive stuff, we still need to, I suppose, recognize that, um, you know, based on the Paris Accord, based on uh, government policy, uh, and particularly the Climate Action Plan that was launched last year and probably a new one to be launched uh, soon, uh, essentially there will be a requirement to reduce emissions further. And, um, you know, this, we won't go into the detail here of individual um, sectors within society, but just to make the point that agriculture has set, been set a target of, um, you know, emissions of maximum 19 million tonnes, and we're currently at somewhere around 20.5 million tonnes, based on IPCC methodology, and that's an important point that we'll talk about in a little second. So there is a requirement to reduce emissions. Um, this slide just shows the marginal abatement cost curve with the technologies that can reduce emissions from Chagas. This was developed a couple of years ago. It relates both the emission reduction and the profitability together in one graph. And it shows what various technologies can do to reduce emissions. And you can see from this that, for example, dairy EBI is one of the big drivers of reduction in emissions. Fertilizer type is a big driver of the reduction of emissions. Low emission slurry spreading is a big driver of the reduction of emissions. Uh, and there's other things in terms of animal health, uh, increasing uh, nitrogen use efficiency, all help to reduce emissions. So the way I look at this marginal abatement cost curve is, this is where technology is today. This is what technology can do today if applied fully on farm level. And there is huge scope to reduce emissions based on that. And to be fair to farmers, there's a huge movement to address or, or take up these technologies. We just take the EBI in terms of EBI use uh, is, is, you know, the uptake is very strong and there's big increases every year. Uh, there's, you know, look at the re most recent starts on fertilizer type and stabilized urea. Sales are increasing quite dramatically. And in terms of low emission story spreading, again, if you look at the uptake is, is quite strong. So, you know, I suppose just to make the point that farmers are taking on these technologies um, and we need to further increase that level of take up. I suppose just to mention then for a second before I hand over to uh, Katie and Ben uh, around the further research. And, you know, this is not exhaustive, there's more than this, but just to put it in context, some of the work that's going on in terms of methane, um, and we talk for a second about GWP star, uh, some of the additive work, genetics in terms of efficiency and methane reduction and sequestration. So I'm not gonna deal with these at all exhaustively, just I'm gonna mention uh, the GWP star, uh, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit then about sequestration. So biogenic methane, it's, you know, probably for most people, it doesn't mean anything. Um, it's become much more interesting or much more discussed um, in, in Irish agriculture and in, um, I suppose, policy terms over the last couple of years, uh, or even shorter over the last year. And I suppose it, what it does is it, it reflects that methane doesn't last as long in the atmosphere uh, as maybe other methodologies assume it does. So currently we use a process or a methodology called global warming potential 100. So that assumes that everything lasts 100 years 
and methane has a multiplier of 28. So for every kilo of methane, you multiply that by 28 to give you the CO2 equivalent. And the same nitrous oxide, you multiply it by 268 to give us CO2 equivalent. So that's the methodology that's currently used by the IPCC. It's currently used in everything I presented so far. Um, but there is a significant discussion now whether that's the right methodology as we go forward, as we talk about methane and in particular bio -me biogenic methane. So I suppose then what's GWP star? It, it's, um, it's a new metric. It reflects that methane has a shorter life in the atmosphere. So basically reflecting that methane has a shorter life, but for that shorter life, it has a much higher multiplier effect. Um, but I suppose it is assumed that it largely disappears, not fully, but it largely disappears the methane and breaks down to CO2, which is available to be taken up by plants after 20 years. Currently, this is not what's used in the IPCC methodology. Um, so that's an important point to know. So, and again, the detail here isn't very important in terms of numbers, but what this shows is our current method or way of looking at methane. And we can see here that um, livestock numbers, um, they're very, they fluctuate between years. You can see that methane in 1998 was 547 or 548,000 tons. Uh, and today that's 519,000 tons. In CO2 equivalent, that's just a multiplier, um, you know, 13.7 tons a million tons of methane versus 13 million tons uh, in 2018. So that's based on GWP 100. If we look at GWP star, and this is using the Kane methodology, and there's a lot of work you know, going on in terms of the methodologies, and that will continue. And um, if you use the GWP star, you get a completely different set of numbers. So just to put it in context, uh, from a methane perspective, the methodology is looking at 20 years. From a methane perspective, what it's saying here is, if we use GWP 100, which is what we currently use, um, the CO2 equivalent from agriculture in 2010 was 11.4 million tons. Uh, using GWP star, that's a minus 2,800. So that's quite a substantial difference. And you can see that we've only started to go into a positive term uh, in 2017, uh, and it's getting positive in 2018. So using GWP star, using the Kane methodology, which is um, uh, a published methodology, essentially what we're saying here is that from a methane perspective, uh, it had a cooling effect over the last decade um, and that we're going into a, a positive zone now from the impact. Uh, I suppose the one, you know, there's a lot of work needed in terms of the methodologies here, but as we look forward, this is something that will get a lot more um, interest and a lot more research this shows from a methane and from an agriculture perspective, obviously this has a dramatic change. Instead of agriculture producing 20 million tons using GWP 100, obviously that's substantially less using GWP star. However, as we go forward, um, these numbers increase because our methane or account numbers have increased relative to what they did, were 20 years ago. Importantly, you know, I suppose this biogenic methane has been recognized and accepted by the Climate Change Advisory Council. It's in the program from government and it's in the Climate Action Bill that was only published in October. So there is a need for a lot of work in terms of understanding what it means from an overall inventory point of view and also from a carbon footprint point of view. All of the carbon footprint, you know, so milk has a carbon footprint of, let's say it's one. What does that mean using GWP star? Maybe, it, you know, do we need to know what's happening on that farm 20 years ago? So there's a lot of work needed to understand how these methodologies are going to work. The final slide for me is in terms of carbon sequestration. And I'm just going to say that, you know, again, huge amount of work uh, just about to start in this area, um, looking at carbon sequestration in grass-based systems and looking at the impact of our system on carbon in the soil, carbon buildup in the soil. And that's something that's really exciting. Um, this is a slide by, again, a French slide by Susanna, Jean-Francois Susanna, and basically showing that, you know, optimum systems, optimum systems are somewhere, you know, of the order, you know, of where our system is sit sitting now in terms of the overall um, animal production, above ground production and carbon sequestration. So I'm sure I'm, I'm going to hand back to you and uh, obviously Katie, uh, I can take any questions if there are questions um, and then Katie and Ben will take on uh, after this. Okay, so Lawrence, thanks very much for that. So just a clarification, I think you kind of said it in the, in the process there, but the, one of the questions was just asking were the emission slides that you're showing, they're used in GWP 100, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and you know, 
the whole thing changes just completely um, when we use GWP star. So we have to, you know, there's a lot of work going on to try and get our heads around how that might work. So if you think of a farm that has 100 cows today, uh, and they had 100 cows 20 years ago, well, their methane probably hasn't changed that dramatically. So the methane component to their emissions is probably non-existent. Whereas if you look at, at a same farm, if it had 100 cows or 50 cows, whatever it was, uh, 20 years ago and 100 cows today, well, then the numbers, you know, the impact could be, could be much, much more. And I suppose the other point here is you're going to talk to Katie and Ben now, but uh, from the point of view of uh, additives or technologies to reduce emissions, whether that's genetics or additives, obviously the, the impact is much, much, much bigger using GWP star. And in effect, we could have a cooling effect from the methane side rather than a warming effect if we can reduce methane substantially. So uh, again, one of the questions that I was anticipating was going to come in is, are the government going to start using GWP star? So um, they probably are. So I suppose if you look at the, you know, the most three most recent documents, um, Climate Advisory Council, uh, Program for Government and Climate Action Bill, all call it out. So um, that's, that's positive. Uh, current methodologies for inventory counting are, um, you know, are set for a period of time. Uh, so, you know, they probably won't get counted in the near time. But I suppose, in fairness, there's probably a good bit of work needed to come up with the, uh, the methodologies that will allow us to be able to count these numbers appropriately. So I just presented the Kane methodologies, which are the Oxford work. And maybe that's the right methodology, but certainly there is need for international agreement on how this is going to happen uh, if we're going to get it implemented within the inventories. And in reality, from the discussions that I've heard, I think the 2030 target is probably going to stay as it is, and it's going to nearly be 2030 before we'll see any implementation at a, a global level of GWP star. So we, that yeah. will put us in a really strong position, though, like if we do implement, like, as you said, the technologies that we're looking for people to implement are positive in terms of farm performance in general anyway. It's not a negative. Um, it does not uh, trade off, we'll say, for going for these technologies. So we'd actually just be strengthening our hand completely by adopting those technologies. And then if we do get to a situation where we do use GWP star, then, then we're going to, be, as you said, probably be in a cooling position that it'll actually be very positive for the industry. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, to, to summarize it, the, the methane effects are magnified using GWP star. So any uh, technology that you have that, that can reduce it um, has a huge impact when, when, it's, when it's implemented. Uh, whereas using the current GWP 100, uh, you, in, you introduce a technology that reduces methane by 20%. Well, that's 20% off 13 million tons. Whereas you could swing a situation from a strong positive to a negative by using GWP star with a 20% reduction in methane, you know, in simple terms. Yeah, okay. And uh, I'd say a final question. So will the, do you think the stock numbers will have to be reduced to hit the 2030 targets? Who knows, Stuart? Who knows? That's, that's one that uh, I suppose is, 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 you know, I suppose what we all need to do is recognize that these challenges are here. We all need to work to put these technologies in place, whether they're additives, whether it's genetics, whether, whether it's getting an understanding of what's happening in terms of soil carbon sequestration, which is hugely important as well. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, if we have technologies, uh, maybe we won't be prohibited from expansion. Okay, very good. That's excellent, Lawrence. Thanks a million. We'll swing over so to John McCabe, who's um, out in the field, up near the advisory building, just up the road from Lawrence uh, with Katie. So I just ask you to unmute there, John. Yeah, perfect. Hi, hi, Stuart. Uh, yeah, so we're just here with Katie Starsmore and Ben Lahart. So Katie is just going to give us a, a rundown of how the methane has been measured here in Moor Park uh, and the, the machine to do it. And Ben is going to go through what the current research is and how, what possible future research will be and how it might relate to the breeding program. So I just, uh, we'll just we'll give it over to Katie here to introduce herself and to go through the machine. Okay, so I'm Katie Starsmore, as mentioned before, and um, obviously I'm not from Ireland, I'm from New Zealand. Um, so behind me here is the machine that we're using to measure the methane. So at the moment, there's one cow in there, um, and so she's getting her methane measured. So once she's out of the machine, I can take you into the machine and show you a bit more. But um, basically how it works is when the cow puts her head into the feed bin, um, air is sucked in through a filter and then through the sensors. So 
and we get live data onto the computer immediately. So the cows that are using the machine need to go into the machine um, for at least two minutes every visit. Um, so to keep them in the machine long enough, we give them concentrate pellets. So basically an incentive for them to use the machine. So they get about 300 grams every visit. Um, and so the, these, these um, concentrate pellets are released every 20 seconds. So I'm not sure if you can hear behind me, but you can hear a chime going um, every about 20 seconds. So every chime is when um, the feed is being dropped to the cow. Um, it's just to keep her in the machine long enough for, for two minutes. If she stays in less than two minutes, then we can't use that, that visit. So um, that's the most important thing about um, using the methane machines. So as you can see, the cows are grazing here. Um, we're using the outdoor green feed um, to measure this methane. So we move the, the green feed along with the cows grazing. So it's just um, outside the passage. So they just exit the, onto the roadway um, to use the machine. And so currently the cows are going indoors at night as well. So we're, we're following the machine with them indoors. Um, so at the moment, we've been looking at methane since June. We plan to have them following the cows outside since um, as soon as calving. But obviously COVID restrictions um, had other ideas. So the cows went outside with the machines um, in June and for measuring since then. So we've had about 40 um, cows okay thanks katie um so just a couple of questions on how how it works so how often does the cow visit the machine during the day so um a cow needs to visit the machine at least twice a day to be able to get good results so as i said before they need to be two minute visits so twice a day two minutes and and do the cows visit at all hours of the day or is it just at certain times of the day yeah, so the cows visit at all hours a day, 24 hours of the day. Um, it's quite interesting when we were looking at the data that there was a big spike of usage at uh, midnight and one o'clock in the morning. Uh, we weren't, weren't really sure why to start with, but when we looked a bit more, we realized that the machine resets and makes a noise. So we think that's why that they go in then. Uh, yeah, otherwise there's no other explanation. Okay, lovely, thanks. Um, so another question there, does the, does the hierarchy within the herd actually affect the results? Um, so obviously there's dominant um, cows in this herd and we thought that there would be a bit of a skew towards the more dominant cows using the machine more. Um, but actually it doesn't come through in the results. They seem to be visiting evenly. Like you can vis visually see that the older cows sometimes bully them and pull them out of the machine. Um, but other than that, they seem to be fine. So I guess the submissive cows go in when, when they can. <laughs> okay. Very good, very good. Um, and how do you limit the amount of concentrates uh, per day that the cows get? So with the machine here, it's um, linked up to the computer inside, and so I can limit each cow how much they get. So they're blocked, so they can only go into the machine and receive concentrate every four hours. Um, and obviously they don't, they're only visiting twice a day, so, well, sometimes three or four times if you let them. So you just have to get that balance right on the computer of blocking them. Okay, and when the cows come in a couple of times a day, um, does, does the methane that's actually emitted from each cow, from say, say cow number 27A comes in at seven o'clock in the morning, she comes again at, in, the, in the evening time. Does the, does the methane emitted change throughout the day? Yeah, so it does actually. So methane is, is quite closely related to the intake. So when the cows come into a paddock like this, fresh grass, um, the their methane will increase um, in about a couple of hours time. That's just because of the digestion process that happens when methane is produced. So we've seen that the methane um, increases after milking majority because the cows are going into fresh grass. Okay, that's interesting. So it's linked to intake, um, and I suppose Ben will go through how methane is, is actually produced there in a minute. Uh, and just the last question there is, uh, are you happy with the data that you're getting, um, that just how clean the data is, and how does it compare to other studies? Yeah, so the data is, is what we expected, which is good news. Um, so we were looking at the pattern of methane throughout the day compared to other, other studies. Um, there's another study going on in um, Tully, which is ICBF progeny testing center, and they're having the same type of um, results as well. Um, and we're looking at other, other research and we're looking like we're getting the same, same sort of data. So it's looking very promising. Um, okay, yeah, so we'll just uh, go for a look around the machine there, Katie, if that's okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. 
so the cows go in through this alleyway here and as you can see at the, the base there there's a feed bin and um, so the holes in the feed bin is where the, the air is sucked in through and there's a filter behind there and um, so the the feed concentrate feed is dropped down the bottom um, and so Ben's just going to drop some feed now to show you how much they get um, each time it chimes. So it's very minimal, it's only 30 grams, so it's not a huge amount. So they get um, that dropped every 20 seconds over a two minute period. So um, yeah, that's, that's the sort of thing that we're looking at. Um, so the, the machine there um, sucks in the methane and then the sensors are actually under the feed bin and then um, it's expelled through the top um, shoot at the top there. Um, yeah, do you have any other questions or do I have to hand it over to Ben? How many of them are there, Jan? No. So okay. how many of the machines are here in Murrow Park as we talk? Um, so there are four. We actually had two new ones arrive yesterday. I'm sorry, last week. Um, so we're using one. This is one of the old ones that we had already. Um, and then there's two new ones that we're just setting up at the moment. Okay, so I think we might just uh, switch over to Ben Lahart here. Is that okay, Stuart? Yeah, perfect, John, yeah. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, so if you could just introduce yourself there and give us a, an idea of what you're doing here in Moor Park, and we might just go through the, the couple of questions then. Hello, so um, my name is Ben Lahart. I'm a researcher working with Katie and Lawrence. So um, I'm looking into research into how to um, mitigate methane from graze, grazing dairy cows um, here. So we're looking at a number of different areas relating to um, between animal nutrition and possibly looking at uh, animal traits um, and their, you know, the I suppose the bigger picture as well on um, the effects of breeding as well. Okay, lovely, thanks. So uh, just to start off with then, um, so how is methane actually produced in the cow? So I suppose the important thing to know about methane is actually, although it's produced by the cow, it's actually bugs in the stomach that are produced as methane. So as the cows um, produce grass and ruminate it and digest it, a byproduct of this is methane. So there's a large number of bugs that produce this methane, and if we can alter the way these bugs work, we can reduce and mitigate methane um, from these cows. Lovely. Um, so the main strategy, what are the main strategies at the minute that, that farmers can use to reduce methane? So I suppose the main strategy that, that can be used is um, improving, uh, improved grassland management. So um, previous work, research has been done here in Moor Park, um, you know, in the last, few, last about 10 years ago, showed that um, as cows grazed, uh, lower pre-grazing um, covers about um, 1,200 um, kilos of dry matter per hectare compared to um, 2,000. There was, um, there was lower methane per kilo of intake and per kilo of milk production as a result of that. Okay, that's interesting. But why is that, Ben? Why, why would there be uh, less methane produced uh, on a lower cover? I thought uh, cows just produced methane as, just, as the same amount per day. So the cows in the lower cover, they're actually capable of eating more grass, but they're producing less methane relative to that grass they're eating. So within the stomach, as I said, the, the more digestible grass, the more leaf in the grass alters the, the way the microbes work and the, the way the different digestive processes work, and that increases efficiency as a result. So increased efficiency, so there are more milk solids produced uh, relative to the methane as well. Okay, that's great. So... Um, just another question there. So on potential of uh, additives to reduce methane. So like additives, like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hot hot topic area in research. Um, and, you know, there's been a stu lot of studies conducted um, indoors showing varying degrees of success. You know, there's been some studies um, that showed success of uh, reductions of up to 80%. Um, you know, but the important point to note is that these are conducted indoors. Cows are fed um, TMR diets and the feed has actually been it's 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 mixed continuously through um through the through the feed. Whereas here, as you can see, cows are grazing grass for the majority of the day, and we can only supplement them with feed additives um, at milking time. You know, in two split two split doses in the concentrate. So, you know, it is it's we're in the early days of research in this, um, and you know, it's it's uh, time will tell as to uh, their success. Okay, that's great. So, um, can you give us an idea of what the methane production of this herd here is? Uh, that that the, the herd that's using the green feed at the moment. So methane production in the herd then, um, herds produce on average about three, between three, 350 and 360 grams of methane a day. Um, and then within the herd then, um, as Katie said, there's, there's um, different lactation numbers. So there's first calvers, there's second calvers and third calvers plus. And what we're seeing is that the, 
the older animals are producing more methane. It's not surprising they're eating more grass to produce more methane, but interestingly, they're more efficient relative to the methane they're producing. So they're, they're producing less methane per kilo of um, milk solids. Um, so it, just, it, it suggests like that as we um, select for fertility within, um, within the EBI, we're going to increase efficiency as a result. Um, and another thing we're noting is that lighter lightweight animals um, are more efficient as well. They're producing less methane per kilo of milk solids. And obviously, um, animals who produce more milk solids are more efficient. So these are, you know, fertility, um, live weight through maintenance and, and uh, milk solids production. We're already selecting for these, so we're already selecting for uh, more efficient animals as a result. Okay, that's great. So what you're saying to me basically is that out across Ireland now in sheds and in fields that there's, there's, there's uh, different efficiency or there's cows with different efficiencies in terms of their methane produced per, per kilo of live weight or per kilo of milk solids um, delivered over their lifetime. So basically, in other words, that the, 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 the more we select for the higher EBI, the fertility, mature the herd, uh, and, and solids, we're, we're, we're going in the right direction, um, potentially. So uh, just to continue on from that, what is the relationship between the current EBI and, um, say, greenhouse gas emissions? And uh, what, what about the possibility of uh, lateness to methane in the future? So um, we did a, a bit of work on the next generation herd there um, last year and we got the total greenhouse gas emissions profile of the national average group and the high EBI group, the elite group. And the results came out that there was no difference in greenhouse gas emissions in total per hectare between the groups, but there was a 10% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions relative to um, milk production by the high EBI group. And that's going back to what I uh, just previously spoke of, that uh, the high EBI cows were... They were more mature, they were living longer, they were more efficient or produced more milk solids um, as a result. Now, going forward, as John said, um, do we potentially, do we select for lower methane? Methane is, um, it is heritable, it is under genetic control. Um, and even within the herd here at present, like we're seeing, there's different, um, there's different efficiencies um, between different animals. So like, for, there's two cows in the herd here that are, like, over the months of July and August are producing 1.7 kilos of milk solids a day, but there was a 20%, 20-25% difference in uh, methane production. So there is variation there, and it is potential, there is potential to select for those lower methane cows. Um, yeah, so. Okay, that's great. Um, I think we'll just hand it over to you, Stuart, if there's any questions that have come back in yet, uh, or if you have any questions yourself. What additives are being trialed at the moment, John? So what additives are being trialed at the moment? Um, so we're, there's, we're trying um, a type of first additive as an essential oil, and we're also looking at um, seaweed, seaweed additives. Um, you know, it's preliminary, we've only really started the research. Um, yeah, like even the seaweed has been shown to, um, a red, it was a red seaweed showed a reduction of up to 80% indoors, but the um, thing about this red seaweed is called asparagopsis, is it's, it's very high in um, iodine content. Um, so you, cannot, you, you can't feed like a very, very high amount of it. So we're looking at, you know, reducing, slightly reducing the amount of um, red seaweed juice and using um, brown, and, brown and green type seaweed as well in the mix and seeing that's effect. Um, as well as that, um, red seaweed, there wouldn't be actually enough of it at present to, um, you know, use on like the national herd in Ireland to mitigate methane. So, yeah. So, John, okay, and uh, sorry, go on, go on. No, go, um, just uh, from the point of view of would Ben see the feed additives as offering great scope, or is there a lot more scope associated with the like better grazing management and DBI, obviously? Yeah, same question as I was going to ask. Uh, so, Ben, do you see um, more scope with the additives or more scope with the grazing efficiency and the genetics? Yeah, so I suppose, um, you know, like all things, like even we've seen with, with milk solids production over the last 10 years, like we've seen it was a combination of management and genetics that led to where we are now. So like probably the same is going to be needed for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So like potentially including methane in the EBI, um, as well as improving grassland management, um, potentially if, if, if we identify additives to work. Um, like management will work straight away. It'll work, you know, the, the day you put those additives in, it'll work. Whereas breeding will take a small bit more time. It'll take, you know, three, three to four years before you see the results. Like, but breeding is cumulative and it will, it will, um, it will you know, compound with each generation. And then, John, I suppose in terms of the, the additives that the lads have used so far, have they found that there's been an initial kick and then a, a drop off, we'll say, as the, as the rumen has adapted to those additives? 
Okay, so the uh, additives that have been used uh, so far, have you found that there's been an initial kick, as in the methane um, bugs have, have changed their, their, their behaviour and there's been less methane emitted initially? But have they, have they altered then after a couple of weeks? Or what's the story there? Do they, is, is it a long-term effect or is it a short-term effect? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Yes, yeah, so like previous studies indoors, I've seen that effects that there can be initial kick after two to three weeks. Um, you know, we were we were in the early days of feeding the seaweed supplement here, so we're in the the, ter- the third week, um, and you know we have we um, you know it's it's three days yet as to whether it will have an effect, but um, you know potentially the room could take five weeks to adapt to the the supplement pasture as opposed to um, straight away indoors so but time will tell okay and John then just um, is it does the, the availability of the concentrate out at pasture cre- create problems for lads in terms of achieving their target residuals during the, the main grazing season yeah okay so the, just a question maybe for Katie as well so um, does the grazing conditions during the year um, can create um, obstacles for you for, for um, yeah, I guess it's a fine balance. So we're working alongside Mike Egan with his grazing trials. So these are his cows that he's using his grazing trials. So we kind of have to work in with that as well. Um, but we've noticed that when it's raining and um, windy, the cows just huddle up in the corner, as you would see before, and they don't use the machine. So there is a few obstacles to overcome, but on a nice day, it, like you can't complain. And even today, like it is starting to rain a bit now, um, and the cows are still using it, happy grazing away. I think as long as I've got food in front of them, they're happy, like they'll, they'll use it. Yeah, very good. So um, I have no more questions coming in anyway, John. So if uh, we can wrap it up with that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think in, just in, just in, in summary here, Stuart, is um, that the, the the additives it's early days yet, uh, but that the, the the initial things that we can do as farmers on the on the ground is uh, just grassland management and, and uh, maturing the herd and, and going for the higher solids cows. So that's uh, following the EBI uh, and and uh, I suppose watch this space. Yeah, super stuff, John. Uh, so thanks to, to Ben and to Katie and obviously to Lawrence as well. And I suppose I'd like to say thanks to Mike Egan and the farm staff as well because of the, they, we had a very heavy rain in Moor Park yesterday, obviously, and grazing is tricky. So they had to do a bit of manipulation there in order to get the coast to be settled for the piece. So thanks to them. So thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in today. And uh, we'll be back again next week. Marion Beecher is coming back to talk to me again next week in relation to uh, labour efficiency. And we're going to be joined by Aidan Ahern from County Waterford who uh, implemented some of the advice that Marion and um, Podrick O'Connor gave to him in relation to his milking routine to speed up his milking process and it's saving him time every day. So we're going to look at that process uh, next week. So thanks for joining in today. I wish you all a pleasant week ahead and take care and stay safe.